Okay. Dan, I am going to introduce you while Davey is taking sure. care of, uh, sounds like a lot of other things. So I believe this is the first time Dr. Werb is speaking with us. Um, and now I'm going back into your bio. I'm so sorry. I had it and then it went away. Um, so um, Dr. Dan Werb is a social epidemiologist and public, and uh, sorry, I'm policy analyst with expertise in HIV addictions, drug policy and implementation science. Dr. Werb is an assistant professor in the Division of ID and Global Public Health at UCSD and at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. He is also the director on the Center on Drug Policy Evaluation, which conducts high impact implementation evaluation and systematic research to support the optimization of drug policy evaluation outcomes. He is an inaugural winner of the US National, uh, of the NIDA, um, Avenir Award, awarded to creative new investigators proposing highly innovative research at the intersection of HIV and substance use. He's done a lot of popular science writing, which you may have seen in the Times, Time, uh, Salon, BuzzFeed, and others. His book about um, an investigation of Tijuana's femicide, City of Omens, A Search for the Missing Women of the Borderlands, was published in June 2019. Um, and then his recent book, The Invisible Siege, The Rise of Coronaviruses and the Search for a Cure, which chronicles the development of coronavirus sirens, was selected as one of the top 10 science books in this season by Publishers Weekly. And Nature described it as a powerfully written study of the pandemic. So we're really excited to have um, Dr. Werb and, and Dr. Davy Smith, as much as he'll be able to um, talk about their work in this area, I will turn it over to you. I'll keep an eye on the chat. And Davey, if you can just let me know if you're like hopping, like if you're, give me a signal so that I know to do more, but I'm gonna let the two of you, you go, we're excited. Welcome. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah I please. Start a little bit, if that's okay. Um, yeah, there's an emergency long COVID call that I need to go run to, but I did want to just quickly talk about how Dan and I, Started how started our conversation and how I got involved in Operation Warp Speed and all that sort of stuff. So basically, um, when Asher and I were uh, with my parents floating around Australia on their cruise that my parents wanted to take, uh, COVID broke out, and at that time it was all uh, headlines and crazy news stories, and nobody knew what was going on, etc. But it was pretty clear that there was a pandemic getting ready to start because you can't really contain a respiratory uh, viral illness um, any place. So it was coming, and it was highly infectious. And at that time, there were some reports showing that hydroxychloroquine uh, could impact uh, the viral process. I was very skeptical, but what I did know is that without any proof, doctors were going to go start using it because that's what doctors do. This is something, something must be done. Therefore this must be done. Um, and there were no good clinical trials or clinical data coming out of anywhere that had uh, COVID at the time that said we should or should not use this drug. So I proposed to the NIH, hey, why don't you get going on this hydroxychloroquine trial and figure this out so we can either use it or not. Um, uh, but they're like, yeah, COVID's not coming, or we don't really think this is going to work. We're not very interested. Um, so that was back in February of 2020. And then it wasn't until a month and a half later when Trump tweeted that everybody should use hydroxychloroquine that they called back and said, hey, why don't you get this started? But in reality, um, the drug was too politically poisoned by that time to really be able to investigate it. So we still don't know to this day whether hydroxychloroquine works for early COVID. Most of the studies and most of the data are in late COVID and that's where doctors were using it because they didn't have anything else. People were um, dying in the hospital and I just thought, well, let's just give them this drug. Um, but that set on the motion of let's find other treatments for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and that is where Dan's story takes off. So I will turn it over here. Thanks so much, Davey. Uh, so let me just share my screen, um, which I always, there we go. I'll assume everyone can see that. Um, yeah, so 
so really the story, um, I, I, as Jill mentioned, you know, this is, I, I recently wrote this book, The Invisible Siege, and it is a popular science account of the history of the science uh, and the rise of coronaviruses from, you know, basically starting in uh, 1980s and then up and through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so um, Davey was a big part of this book. I interviewed him. Um, and today I'm just going to uh, present to you um, some of the major themes from the book, drawing on a few select interviews. So this is really going to be narrative. Um, and if you want to call it anything, you could call it a qualitative uh, presentation broadly. Um, oh, how do I do this? Yes, here we go. So, you know, I think where I start uh, is that when you're thinking about pandemic prevention, you're, there are really three intersecting forces that uh, always are at play. So there's, of course, science, which is the self-correcting system of knowledge. And then there's prescience, which is, you know, the definition is knowing something before it happens. But really, this is about, you know, people's uh, understandings of future threats and, you know, how powerful those understandings are and how much will they and, and uh, um, ability they have to enact things based on that prescience. And then, of course, there's the politics. And, and, and it, in its broadest definition, we're just talking about how power is structured. And, you know, I think we can talk about politics and the way that we all understand it. But also, you know, to my mind, we're talking about how power is structured through how uh, discoveries are made, what's the process by which they're made, and how are they distributed, and by whom. So those are the three pieces, right? So because of that, the response to COVID, the response to all epidemics, all pandemics, is necessarily idiosyncratic. It's built on existing infrastructure. It's driven by personality. Again, this prescience, you know, who knew what, who thought what, and how passionately were they able to uh, engage with that. And it's motivated, motivated and constrained by the prevailing system of discovery. And so, you know, what I find so fascinating and one of the stories that I think has not really been told is, <clears throat> to the general public at least, is how much of the scientific response to HIV was completely cannibalized and taken up to produce the COVID uh, response. And I'm really thinking of structurally about the large structures at play. And then, you know, in terms of personality, the fears and hopes for, of, uh, of particular people for the future and our future pandemic threats. And then when I'm talking about prevailing system of discovery, you know, really we exist uh, by most people's definitions and understandings within this for-profit system of knowledge uh, creation, which of course has ramifications uh, globally. So, what is the scientific response to HIV? I mean, at the highest sort of structural level, at least in the United States, we're talking about the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, Vaccine Research Center, and the HIV Prevention Trials Network. So these are sort of like the government entities that are, uh, in a lot of ways, um, just the structure uh, powering the response to HIV. And, uh, you know, of course, there is this ecosystem of academia and um, science and uh, uh, for-profit and non-profit company or uh, organizations, but at the heart in terms of the governmental structures at play, these are the, the key groups and engage in vaccine development, antiviral development and prevention work. And, you know, with, without any uh, exception, they were essentially wholesale conscripted or conscripted themselves to undertake the, to, to form the infrastructure uh, for the COVID science, the, 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 uh, the response, the, the scientific response to COVID. And so when we're thinking about Operation Warp Speed is this like light switch, I mean, it, it's a, an incredible light switch in terms of how rapidly these structures, which you know any government structure is hard to kind of uh, massage in a different direction, but, but how quickly these structures were all brought to bear uh, in uh, the work to prevent uh, the spread of COVID. So here's uh, Chris Byer, past president of the International AIDS Society, a very uh, august um, researcher who's worked on inequities and, uh, and prevention. He described it as a homecoming. Um, so he was brought in uh, by Larry Corey to uh, help lead the COVID prevention network uh, efforts. So you know these were efforts to engage with community to or it, with um, with communities that were disproportionately impacted by COVID nineteen, 
um, you know, uh, and that um, maybe didn't have access to um, healthcare at the same level as the general population. So he said, it's striking to me how many people with HIV backgrounds are involved in the COVID response. It's like a homecoming. And for him, he hadn't been doing a lot of not, uh, he, he had been doing more prevention epi work and non-vaccine work. And then suddenly he was brought into this effort uh, through Operation Warp Speed that really integrated those efforts with the vaccine development as well. And, and so for a big part of um, uh, a big part of the COVID PN work that Chris invol is involved in is engaging with, with issues around vaccine hesitancy, particularly among uh, minority populations. And you know, I think going back, you know, we, we think about how, the, how effective the scientific response to COVID-19 has been setting aside all the sort of like social and political issues. Like you cannot argue with the, inc the incredible speed and effectiveness of uh, the treatments and vaccines that were brought to bear. But this is, you know, in, again, going back to this, no this notion of science as a self grasping system of knowledge, within the system of knowledge, no information is lost, right? So I think it's, it's fascinating to reflect when you're looking at, the, at how celebrated the COVID-19 science story is to these, the idea that HIV vaccinology has been a failure. So here's a quote from Bart Haynes, uh, uh, another incredible virologist, uh, leads the Duke Human Vaccine Institute. It says, take HIV for, for an example. Um, we thought in 1984 and 85, this is gonna be a one year job. And here we are 40 years later. And, and here's uh, a still from Margaret Heckler, um, her press conference in 1984, when she announced the probable cause of AIDS uh, was a virus. And, and this was you know two, three years after um, uh, what was then known as GRID, gay-related immune disease, or uh, yeah, gay-related immune disease uh, first emerged. Um, this was also, you know, raised to me by Barney Graham, the now uh, retired deputy director of the Vaccine Research Center at NIAID. You know, he described those early days uh, when the virus was identified, you know, as a time of hopefulness, right? We were so naive at the moment, he said, we were just glad to know it was caused by a viral disease because it had been three years that nobody knew what it was. Um, but then very quickly ran into issues. Uh, and the key issue was that the existing vaccine platforms that were being used were eliciting antibodies, to, but those antibodies were not protected. So Barney was one of the first uh, people to uh, run a and uh, a vaccine trial in the United States. And you know, this massive level of excitement, right? You had isolated the, the pathogen and it was then just a, a, a hop, skip and a jump to producing a vaccine. This eventually just turned into frustration. And, and again, the frustration was that there was nothing, you know, the, the complexity of the immune response had not been really queried or explored to a massive degree because it wasn't necessary. Vaccines just worked. And uh, that of course changed with HIV. So you started from the HIV-1 discovery and here's a long, long and um, demoralizing uh, series of vaccine trial failures uh, that continue, right? And, and so, you know, that of course, as those, uh, uh, failures continued, there was this shift to antiretrovirals. Here's Bart Haynes again, describing how in, in 2005, there was this moment of, you know, it was, a, it was an axial moment in the, in the fight against HIV. There were 60 different vaccine candidates. Um, some of them had been duplicated in the NIH pipeline along with uh, by um, pharma companies. And basically, you know, the head honchos came together and said, this is not working, right? So that was this, the time when the, what, what Bart describes as, you know, the drug companies, the pharmaceutical industry uh, had really been focusing on drug development and had, and had at that point, you know, really honed the effectiveness of antiretrovirals as a response to the epidemic. And that also sort of saw the vaccine work um, 
you know, basically, you know, shift to the background as antiretrovirals became this incredible, not only treatment, but of course, as the, as their uh, effectiveness increased, um, you know, this led to, um, of course, the, the treatment as prevention efforts and this re kind of organization of antiretrovirals as not just treatment, but as prevention. And then Barney Graham, you know, describes how in 2008, 2009, technologies came together to allow for um, HIV vaccine work that had not yet happened. And this was really the merging of a number of different streams of knowledge and technology development in areas that, you know, in some cases had nothing to do with um, vaccines at all. So on the one hand, um, you know, uh, there was the work on immunology and understanding how uh, the immune system responded to threats, uh, something that, again, hadn't really been explored in very, very, very deep complexity prior to the failure of HIV vaccines. And then all of these incredible technologies had also sort of come together in this incredible way um, and, you know, had at this moment basically you know, uh, people who are vaccinologists were basically poised to integrate all of them together. So this was structure-based vaccine design. So this is, you know, we think about the, the ways in which um, uh, the actual antigen is developed and engineered within vaccines uh, to protein engineering, single cell analysis, definition of antibody lineage, which is of course really, really important in the case of HIV. And then uh, the discovery of new human monoclonal antibodies, rapid gene synthesis and that. These core technologies are what have changed vaccinology and it's been happening now only for a little over 10 years, right? So we're, we're still in the precipice of this potential golden age of vaccinology where all of these technologies have come together and the failure of the HIV vaccine efforts have allowed us to uh, advance our knowledge uh, deeply in all of these different realms. And um, yeah, I'll just, maybe I'll, I won't dwell too long here, but, you know, just to say that um, for Chris Byrer, his work on, again, the prevention network side of, of COVID uh, was constricted because, you know, he said, I don't really know much about vaccines. I, I'm, I'm a shoe leather epidemiologist. And, and the response from Larry Corey, who was putting these things, the, these, um, the structure together was what we really need help with is the community engagement, community empowerment piece, and dealing with some of the socio-political aspects of this that are going to be challenging. And again, you know, these are knowledge, these are lessons learned out of HIV prevention work uh, that, of course, can just be directly and were directly applied onto uh, the COVID prevention efforts. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, to this pandemic prescience piece, right? So, you know, individuals who have a sense of the dangers emanating from the future. And there is this truly incredible uh, situation that happened where on April 6, 2018, Ralph Barrick, a uh, coronavirologist, an epidemiologist, and, you know, someone who's uh, generally recognized as the foremost authority on uh, coronaviruses, had been working on it for since the 1980s. He gave a speech at his uh, university, the University of North Carolina, to commemorate the centennial of the Spanish flu. This was the last session in th over three days of this symposium on the Spanish flu. So the, he steps up to the lectern. This is on YouTube also. So you can, you can check it out if you, if you are interested. And he says, well, I have to admit, I'm a little worried about giving this. The reason is being labeled a harbinger of doom. So then he puts up this slide. And this is his opening slide. How bad could the next pandemic be? What might it look like? And will we be ready? And of course, there's Ralph Barrick, a smiling Ralph Barrick. Uh, and he sort of inserted himself into the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, an arrow going from him. Uh, to plague. Audience laughs, says, this is not me. I'm not one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I'm really kind of a nice guy. So over the next 35 minutes, 
Barrick, who had by that point, you know, again, he had been studying coronaviruses since the 1980s. He had been through the initial SARS uh, epidemic in 2002, 10% mortality, infected about uh, 10,000 people worldwide, killed almost 1,000, had been through MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, another coronavirus that emerged in 20, less than a decade later in Saudi Arabia, um, transmitted uh, uh, the, the, um, the animal reservoir was camels, remains camels because it's still active. Uh, and uh, has between 35 to 50 percent mortality. And so he he knew a thing or two about uh, pandemics. And um, you know, he had this prediction, the series of predictions about the next pandemic. And he didn't say that the next pandemic would be a coronavirus. Um, but his predictions were that there would be a rush for bogus antiviral treatments. There would be huge profits for companies that made surgical masks, PPE, um, diagnostic tests, things like that. There would be huge global economic downturn, borders would harden, and there would be a rise in conspiracy theories claiming that the virus was man-made. And, you know, about 18 months later, you get the spillover event, uh, the cluster of pneum pneumonias in Wuhan, and the rest is history, right? Um, but it just is so fascinating to me uh, that Ralph Barrick was at this time, you know, so presciently thinking about uh, how to, what, what the next pandemic would look like. But beyond that, he had actually been doing so much work over decades to understand how we might prevent. So, um, and again, this is, <laughs> it's fascinating to me how much of a pandemic's response depends on a person's passion, vision, and luck. So I'll just pause here and say, Ralph Barrick, you know, uh, in the wake of the MERS epidemic, you know, he had now gone through two epidemics and really he got into the field, as you can read from the side here, he got into the field just basically out of an abstract passion for virology. He wasn't interested in the high stakes, um, you know, center stage virological efforts that went on with, um, with the early days of the HIV pandemic. No, he was interested in understanding why the genomes of coronaviruses, which were RNA viruses, were so much larger than theoretically possible. So this is someone who was driven from the early days, days by an abstract um, desire for knowledge uh, and understanding of viruses. And, you know, he, he basically worked as someone in that field on, for 20 years, from 1982 to 2002, until the SARS epidemic occurred. And when I asked him about that, you know, he said, uh, I said, what does it feel like when, you know, something you've worked on in the laboratory for so many years uh, suddenly comes to life out in the real world? And he, and he described it as an exhilaration with a sickness in the pit of my stomach. Um, and, you know, at that point, he said also, it was a shock that SARS emerged, right? Up until then, there had been no pathogenic coronaviruses um, or human pathogenic coronaviruses uh, that anyone had ever seen. Uh, he said it was a shock, but not a surprise. So, but he had for 20 years been studying the capacity of coronaviruses to move between species. And he knew very well from his laboratory work that coronaviruses had the capacity to, uh, and, and were actually elegantly primed to jump and move between species um, uh, by um, exploiting orthologs uh, in uh, cellular walls, and also by, um, you know, the capacity of the spike protein to rapidly mutate to, uh, to identify um, weaknesses or to exploit vulnerabilities. So based on, you know, SARS emerges 2002, 10 years later, MERS emerges 2012. At that point, Barrick realizes, okay, we've now got a trend. We've got two viruses from the same family that have emerged within a decade of each other. That's basically no time in the viral universe. So this is now a trend. We are now looking at uh, uh, when, not if, for a future um, coronavirus spillover event. So how do you 
deal with that. If you're Barrick and you're prescient and you think about these things and you're, uh, you know, him and his partner, Mark Dennison, another coronavirologist who uh, uh, has been his collaborator for decades now, decided that um, they needed to find a solution to the future facing threat. And of course, that's the problem, right? How do you uh, deal with a threat from the future that you can't see and you don't know what it is? Because every pandemic is going to be caused by pathogen that we haven't yet seen, right? That's basically the nature of the game. So Barrick and Denison realized, okay, we have, um, you know, basically at this point, 50, 100, you know, dozens at least, dozens and dozens of strains, coronaviruses, variants, SARS variants, MERS variants, and a number of uh, hundreds of, of uh, coronaviruses that had been uh, cultivated out of bats um, and other creatures uh, internationally. So there were these SARS-like um, coronaviruses that were in bats. And they realized, you know, the way that Barrick put it, if you've got an encyclopedia and you've got, it goes from volume one to volume 50, and you know that, uh, if, if you have a, a, a treatment that's effective against volume one to volume 50, it's almost certainly going to be effective against volume 51. So what he was describing here is uh, identifying conserved regions uh, in uh, uh, coronaviruses across all strains that would be susceptible uh, uh, to, um, to treatment. So, you know, he works in academia. Uh, Mark Dennison works in academia, so they didn't have the billions of dollars required to develop new drugs. So they started this work of sifting through existing broad-based antivirals to find uh, antivirals that might be effective against all coronaviruses. They started with 400,000 drugs in the years after uh, MERS. And, um, you know, I, I'll get to it now, but, uh, you know, he made this joke at the end of this um, uh, of this little story about choosing coronaviruses over over HIV and said it's a good example of fine decision making on my part that took about 30 years to come to fruition right um, so that's a joke but um, ultimately you know that is indeed what happened so beyond this work identifying uh, potential broad-based antivirals Barrick has uh, done incredible work around under our understanding uh, of um, of coronavirus. So he's mapped the structural biology of the spike protein, different coronavirus regions as well. He uh, has perfected uh, cloning uh, viruses and to use that uh, approach to um, create synthetic chimeras in the lab that were um, that he used to test, uh, you know, basically the etiology, epidemiology, and potential treatments against uh, coronaviruses. And he was also able to do this in a number of different uh, respiratory cells, which I think is really key. So this is someone who had been testing how coronaviruses infected cells in, in the respiratory system in laboratory models, but in a variety of cells. So really creating a distinction between the upper respiratory and lower respiratory systems and, and seeing how the immune response uh, differed. Now, I, 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 <laughs> I don't wanna uh, scoop myself here, but basically one of the drugs that Barrick ended up working on identifying was remdesivir. But it's hilarious to me when you look at the, the story that is told about these drugs, that, in, that is told about the COVID response in general, it's all the story of miracle work, right? You look at the Operation Warp Speed, flip the switch, nine months later, you have vaccines. And here is a, a screen grab from Gilead's page. Uh, Gilead owns Remdesivir. And so Gilead tells the story of their antiviral research on um, you know, potential COVID treatments. And they start the clock at February 21st, 2020. Well. Actually, Barrick and his partners published the first uh, paper identifying the potential uh, effectiveness of uh, remdesivir, which was GS5734, in 2017. By that point, 
Remdesivir had been around for you know years and years and years. It had been developed. It had originally been developed by Gilead as a hepatitis C drug, and it failed. Then Gilead tried to shift it uh, to be a potential Ebola cure. That also failed. And it was really the um, entrepreneurialism of Ralph Barrick and Mark Dennison, who had been shift, sifting through these 400,000 existing broad-based antivirals and identified the potential for remdesivir to be broadly protective uh, against epidemic and zoonotic coronaviruses. And this is the work that, this is the reason why remdesivir was so rapidly provided with an emergency use authorization by FDA. It wasn't that the clock started on February 21st, 2020. No, this work had been going on for years and years and years. Similarly, um, uh, another of two uh, broad-based antivirals that uh, Barrick and Dennison landed on out of this initial uh, 400,000 was this uh, EIDD 2801, which had been developed in the academy uh, and um, uh, is, you know, is now sold under the uh, trade name Molnupiravir. And, but again, it was Ralph Barrick, Mark Dennison, who had done the work of testing this drug, had identified its potential and had essentially primed the COVID response uh, understanding that it was a when, not if, a new coronavirus would emerge. And I will also just say that Pfizer's Paxlovid pill, of course, includes a protease inhibitor used in HIV treatment. So, you know, this, the, the story of the response is so much longer and, and so much more dependent on these initial uh, foundations uh, than anyone really uh, understands in the general public. And I'll just say, you know, uh, a last note here on molnupiravir. This is from uh, Barrick's uh, paper, looking at the effectiveness of molnupiravir against uh, uh, COVID-19 infection. And you look at this last um, bar graph on the right, you know, this is pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this is testing a, an approach uh, that is that was uh, refined, of course, in the fight against HIV, as a potential um, approach to preventing uh, pandemics come, uh, arising from coronaviruses. So you've got only you know going back to this notion of like the actual re HIV research infrastructure being wholesale adopted to create Operation Warp Speed, but you've got these concepts, right? This this concept of PrEP, uh, this idea, this understanding that you can use antiretrovirals even when vaccines are ineffective or failing to control pandemics, you know, brought to bear in the fight against coronaviruses. So now I'll just move on to politics, right? And here we're talking about basically who has the power to create intervention, uh, innovations, discoveries, and where do they get distributed? So here is Derek Rossi. He's a very smart guy. He is uh, one of my countrymen, a Canadian like me. Um, but we, uh, and, and I can just tell you, we don't all have soul patches uh, like Derek Rossi. Um, so I asked Derek Rossi, I mean, he, he's the co-founder of Moderna. Moderna's uh, technology is, is based uh, essentially on his discoveries in the lab. And I asked him, you know, when he founded uh, Moderna in 2010, were vaccines on his radar? And he said, I wish to say that I had that insight, but I didn't. And nobody at Moderna did either. And I think really, he said, the main reason was it was dismissed as just a non-viable business model. Then he says, you know, fact is the technology, as we've all seen, it's the perfect application for mRNA technologies. And it's actually a great first application for the technology to demonstrate uh, how effective it can be. So Rossi went on, you know, I pushed him a little bit on this, um, you know, about why vaccines weren't part of the sort of Moderna approach and, and you know, what were constraining, um, what was constraining Moderna from engaging in vaccine work that really, you know, wasn't potentially going to be the highest um, 
a financial winner, but was nevertheless, you know, really, really important. He said, you have to sink in so much money to develop a drug that, you know, in a free market system, there better be a reward or the possibility of a big financial reward on the other side. We would not have drugs to were it not for this market. So, I mean, he's somebody who truly believes that it's the for-profit system that has generated uh, the innovations and that really there's no other way to do it. He said, you, if you take away that incentive and say, you can't be thinking about money, say goodbye to biotech and pharma. They won't do it. There'll be no innovation. There'll be no new, big, risky type stuff. And, you know, he said, not to put too fine a point on it, there, there would basically be no Moderna. There would be no mRNA vaccines because it took billions of dollars to generate. Now, my counter to this is, okay, yes, but you know, here is some up-to-date data on uh, vaccine equity. And you can see that still the number of, or the proportion of population in low-income and lower middle-income settings that have access to at least one dose is incredibly poor. So what is, a scientific discovery if it actually can't be used by a massive proportion of the global population. And then the other question is like, should we take at face value that the new big risky, risky type discoveries really come from the for-profit system? Barney Graham, uh, you know, long a government scientist at the NIH, unsurprisingly disagrees. He says, we know that just about every product in the drugstore has been developed at some level by NIH. Grants to universities, developed intramurally, supported by small business grants, NIH is behind almost every pharmaceutical innovations. And he says that drug companies, like they're, they're not even researching anymore. They're just going out and picking and choosing what to buy. So to, to hit home this point, I just wanna read this last quote here on, on, this, um, uh, on this slide. This is not Barney Graham, this is someone else. Governments understand the need to protect their population, which is why the United States government paid us to develop a Zika vaccine before Zika was a problem in the US. Everybody's always afraid of the next pandemic influenza against which you don't have a vaccine. So we've had this dual strategy of both developing the vaccines for the private market and developing the capability, if not the actual vaccines, to go against pandemic sh threats should they actually come to the pass. So, I mean, who among us can uh, guess who that is? It's actually Tal Zaks, who in 2015 was brought in as the chief medical officer of Moderna. So what, what Tal's saying is that the innovation to produce vaccines, the new big risky type discoveries that Moderna engaged in was actually driven by the government. And so he's contradicting his, the, the former CEO who had, by that point had left Moderna. And you know, basically I, I see this as a much more nuanced understanding. And of course it's, it's the facts, right? Like Moderna was not in the vaccine space they were a young company looking for credibility. NIH was looking for a, a partner in the, in the for-profit system, in the, in the private uh, system to help them distribute, uh, to help them uh, produce vaccines. And so they, Moderna was a great candidate because the technology was so great as well. So, you know, it was the NIH that funded Moderna to create not only a Zika vaccine, but also a MERS vaccine candidate, which is critical when you think about how quickly Moderna was able to get their SARS-2 uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine into clinical trials run by the NIH, right? And as an aside, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me that the whole idea of a vaccine as um, mRNA as a vaccine was driven by this issue that Moderna was having where an immune response to the mRNA that was being introduced to cells, like that was a problem, right? They were trying to get, um, they were trying to develop therapies for rare diseases where you know, somebody had a missing gene and couldn't produce a, a protein. It was gonna be these mRNAs that were gonna you know, allow, uh, instruct cells to produce the, the missing proteins, but they were being attacked by the immune system. And so that's where he says, a few people in Moderna asked, well, how can we take 
this bug and turn it into a feature. And I think that's like an, the incredible story of um, how they shifted from rare diseases or the primary focus on rare diseases to vaccines. And I'll just say here, you know, in terms of science and politics, it goes beyond the market. It, and, you know, we're, I think, lucky in the field of HIV and public science to have someone like Tony Fauci at the helm. Bernie Graham describes uh, Fauci's brilliance at leveraging social situations to do the most good for science, how when HIV came, he leveraged the crisis to pour huge amounts of money into immunology research, and how immunology, of course, has been a fundamentally different field because of it. And then in the wake of um, HIV, he doubled the NIAID budget to improve our knowledge of immunology. But that wasn't it. Like when 9-11 and anthrax happened, this whole issue of bioterror, bioweaponry, you know, I think that like could actually have spelled under uh, the leadership of someone else. I'm just purely speculative here, but you know, you could have seen potential budget cuts as a response of to the threats posed by bioweaponry, either at home or abroad. But you know, instead, we we see uh, Tony Fauci leveraging this concern around biodefense to double the NIAID budget again. And so Barney Graham's hope is that you know, out of COVID, we can see another five to ten billion a year to focus on pandemic preparedness, and that would really change uh, how uh, things look in ten or twenty years. And so, you know, on the on the science side, like all of this, you know, the again, no information is lost. HIV vaccine failures have been turned into success, and that initial success here is. Um, I think so evident in um, the response to COVID-19. In terms of um, the work that has happened towards uh, that can support HIV vaccine development, there's confirmational evasion issues, which have been solved um, in some ways through this, um, you know, the the structure structure-based uh, uh, antigen development, it's particularly around this RSV vaccine research and the two P spike protein that were both developed by the Vaccine Research Center at NIAID. There's genetic variation and immune dominance issues that were explored by a influenza vaccine work. And then there's this glycosylation and these basically these envelope issues that have been addressed somewhat um, by coronavirus vaccines as well. So all of this moving back into this positive blowback on HIV vaccine development. Um, you know, and as Bernie Graham says, we solve some of these other things, we can go back to HIV, but it has been the HIV work that's driven all of them in the first place. And of course, you know, we've seen that, right? We've seen now proof, uh, safety, efficacy uh, of mRNA vaccines uh, with COVID, uh, particularly, you know, um, uh, yeah, with, with COVID. And so now looking at launching this platform uh, to, uh, uh, to develop HIV vaccines. So what about the wrong lessons? I mean, one of the most stark failures, I think to me, again, is of course, this low level of distribution of vaccines globally and the kind of myopia that um, I think some scientists have uh, around how the ways in which discovery happens actually influences how it's distributed, right? And I think for some people like Derek Rossi, and others, um, and I don't want to single them out because I think you know this is this is really across the board. Most scientists, when they're working on drug discovery, don't really think about how you know the complications around patenting and IP and um, material transfer agreements and all of that are going to, at the end of the day, influence access. Right? They have enough to wor to worry about in the lab. So that's one one issue. And then the other is you know on the bottom here. <laughs> we have currently over 350 COVID-19 vaccine candidates in development. Like who needs another brand of ketchup at this point? We have so many effective vaccines on the market for this particular virus. So why, why has the market determined that it is a better use of resources to continue to build on uh, uh, something, a solution for a problem that already has multiple effective solutions. And that of course is, you know, quite frustrating. 
and then, you know, I think Barney Graham, smart person, um, one of his thoughts was all of these pandemics start as regional diseases, even H A very obscure regional uh, emerging infection in the 60s and 70s. And the tools that were lacking were surveillance and, um, you know, some protocols and potentially some uh, uh, treatments uh, that could have uh, uh, caused it to remain a small problem. So we basically need to understand that a problem anywhere is a problem everywhere. I personally think that the rise of variants and their emergence across or in, in non-immune populations and their rapid emergence across the entire globe, like that's a great lesson in why we should be looking to vaccinate the entire globe if we really are serious about getting out of, back, of, of uh, this pandemic. Um, but, you know, surveillance and focusing on these emerging epidemics is going to be really important. So I'll just end there. Um, and in the interest of time, maybe I won't belabor the point on um, all of these uh, issues that I covered, but you can read them here. Uh, and, you know, I'll just say, if this interests you, uh, just a few positive uh, reviews, I encourage you to pick up a copy of the book. I think you'd all really like it. And uh, I will stop there. And I just want to acknowledge all the scientists who took the time to talk to me, including Davey, who um, I, uh, I didn't want to embarrass by including quotes from today, but he was a big part of the book as well. So I will stop there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dan. That was that was a uh, that was great, um, and thank you for not embarrassing me. Um, <laughs> so, so I just have a few few questions of like, so where should we go now? I know that uh, you talked a little bit about vaccines and sort of like we have a lot of them, but we don't really have a lot of therapies, or that the uh, virus keeps evolving, and we um, and <laughs> getting rid of therapies that we thought we had before, but it's also in the same setting for vaccines too. Um, the virus is clearly evolving away from immune responses. So it just makes it harder to corral. I didn't know if you had any thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it, what we're learning is that vaccines are really effective at the outset of a pandemic, but as variants emerge, you need to look at uh, treatments and approaches that focus on the conserved regions, right? So I think that's, again, learning from HIV and the lessons of HIV. You need a massive roster of, anti uh, of antivirals, right? Broad-based antivirals, antivirals that are gonna uh, attack conserved regions and that can essentially fill the gap where vaccines start to fail or attenuate a little bit. Um, so I think that's the big piece. And then, you know, the other piece is just thinking about how to, how to, you know, I'm not, I'm not out here saying we need to burn everything down to the ground in terms of the for-profit system of discovery, but there, there can certainly be a recalibration, right? A re-understanding of like, where, what is the power imbalance between um, the for-profit system and government, right? And I think the story is so illuminating in that they were moved into this vaccine space, nudged quite hard by government spending. Right? And I think if we can uh, focus those efforts and that strategy on development of um, vaccine candidates for viral families that are known to infect humans or have the capacity to infect humans, like I think we, we want this sentinel, the set of sentinel vaccines for viral families that uh, we know can, can uh, potentially cause pandemics in the future. Yeah, one, one of the things that uh, I learned recently is uh, about the U.S. government. Their goal wasn't, you know, to make vaccines, was it to make therapies, but they wanted to spend money to de-risk companies to be able to have those, um, to make those, right? So they put in tons of money into COVPN, they put in tons of money into Active, but specifically around you're a company, you have some technology or you have some know-how to make a vaccine or a treatment, and we're going to take away that initial uh, R&D risk in terms of clinical trials or whatever. And do you think that that's a good model going forward? Or, or did that make, first of all, did that make any sense what I was talking about? And second of all, is that a good model for how the government, who has a vested interest, we the people have a vested interest in these uh, therapies and vaccines um, for the development of the next generation of vaccines and treatments? Like, absolutely. If only because the, if you look at the lowest risk path in terms of drug discovery or scientific discoveries, it's always going to be incremental improvements, 
Like that's always going to be the lowest risk path. That's why we see like incremental improvements on uh, therapies for, for chronic illness and chronic disease. Um, and so anything you can do to de-risk future oriented discovery, really, like it is a tough sell when you say, and, and, you know, one scientist at UNC, Nat Mormon said to me in 2019, or, or sorry, in early 2020, he said, how much would you have caught, how much would you have paid me for a COVID-19 vaccine a year ago? Zero, right? But if you had been the person sitting on that COVID vaccine in February, 2020, like you gazillionaire. So de-risking that and, and creating a space that allows for companies to um, get a little abstract in their goals and, and tangential market, I think is always a good thing. Cool, I have other questions, but I think we should open up to the audience if that's okay. I'll hang out with you later. <laughs> there was nothing in the chat. It was a surprisingly quiet group. Maybe they were just so well, then, taking then it all I, in. I, I have a question. Let me, gonna, right, go, go ahead, Jill. I have other... Oh, was that Darcy raising her hand or no? I think she was doing something else. Um, I, and mine, I don't want to get away from coronavirus, but um, you know, now that we're starting to see, I don't want to call anything a pandemic, but our, our new emerging infection, um, monkeypox. Um, what, what lessons do we think we can learn from coronavirus um, and, and what's happened and not make the same mistakes or at least make them less? Um, I, I'll just say, you know, we, we may have seen our first case in our clinic yesterday, and it seemed like it was just people running around in circles, not knowing what to do with anything without, you know, any real, um, you know, infrastructure in place. And it seems hard to imagine that after ha having gone through all of this, we'd be in the same spot again with something new. Yeah. I, you know what? My take on this is very early on, like we've been through the most incredible masterclass in the limits and evolution of science. And I think that needs to be leveraged as we move forward. Like people now understand in a way that they didn't prior to the pandemic, that things change, facts on the ground change, scientific understanding of pathogens change. And I think that needs to be like for me in terms of communicating risk to the public, that is the single greatest lesson that cannot be lost, right? Like, I don't think if we had to redo it over again, no one is gonna come in and say like, masks definitely don't work or they definitely do work or like, you know, like these kind of, um, these statements, these absolute statements about what we do and do not know as scientists, I think that's something that must absolutely be avoided in the future because people are smart, right? And I think now that we've all been through it, people like understand that, things change and that not ev everyone is infallible. Um, so I would create uh, the communication around science and public health um, strategies starting from that place. Questions are pouring in now. So. <laughs> Sheldon, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so one thing that I really, um, that you didn't touch on that I thought was really struck me so far has been the fragility of our a supply chain for things like you know you think of the the uh, baby formula issue right now because one plant shuts down if you're trying to make a drug now and you oftentimes they use with a Chinese uh, you know manufacturer you know you it is so hard to get things in and out of China products are really slow to get to make the bare, bare bones to make the drug um, you know there, there's so much shortages uh, and things just fell apart and so how that I was looking for solutions for that problem as well. Yeah I mean I think like a, a, what we've learned particularly around um, manufacturing is that manufacturing is not uh, like the, the I, I think even even with the waiver of patents I'll, I'll talk about like drugs specifically and vaccines, even with waiving patent, uh, patents, that doesn't actually get lower and middle income countries any closer to getting access. Because the manufacturing that goes into creating these vaccines and distributing them is basically like industrial secrets. So if we're thinking about how to create a more equitable supply chain, uh, particularly in the, in the case of drugs and vaccines, 
Like, I think we need to think bigger about what information we are willing to share um, with others. And, um, and, and I know that there's been some efforts now to improve the capacity of lower and middle income countries to produce these things. And I think like, that's a really, really important model on like broader supply chain issues. That is kind of beyond my scope. I'm not an economist or I don't even know who studies those kinds of things, what you would call them, but uh, yeah, can't answer that. Davey looks like he's pondering. There are a couple more questions. I And I realize we just have a couple of minutes. The, the first one was, does your book talk about the role of the WHO and the CDC in the response? It, it does a little bit. There are some hints. Davey is featured in a little bit of that. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting stories I find is looking at the solidarity trial and uh, its testing of remdesivir in particular. Barrick, who develop, you know, you know, who tested remdesivir has some spicy things to say about um, the understanding, like the general understanding of how to use remdesivir. And, and I think that's really quite interesting. There's some other surprises as well. Yeah, it, there was a good question in there from Nettie about the rest of the world. And I think that's really important. I, I just heard a really good talk from an economist. And she said that $600 billion should be spent every year to prepare for the next pandemic, not during the time of pandemic, every year. From an economist point of view, that would be what would be um, reasonable um, to stop or at least uh, slow down or to help with the, pre with the next coming pandemic, because there will be one, um, even if we call this a rare event of 2% per year. Um, so that was amazing to me. But the other thing she said was, um, we need to build capacity all throughout the world. So it goes to Nettie's question and to Sheldon's question that we need to have capacity to build vaccines, to make treatments, et cetera, that are well-established and ready to go with a push of a button um, so that the whole world is covered when a pandemic, because we are really all in this together. And like, I would just say again, like the prescient, like thank God that we had people who were coronavirus researchers who had been studying this, right? Like in a way, thank God this was a coronavirus, right? And then the other thing, thank God that there was the HIV pandemic and all of the research infrastructure in place and so well-resourced that, and, and so able to be so quickly um, uh, operationalized in, uh, into COVID. Cool. So I wanted to thank everybody. Thank Jill. Thank, of course, Dan. It's been a super, I, I, it's fascinating every time I hear it. And definitely uh, everybody should read the book because it's good. Just skip over the embarrassing part, some quote from me. That would be great. <laughs> Thanks all. Thanks so much, Dan. This was great. Awesome. Glad you liked it. Bye. Bye.